Welcome to another episode of Unstoppable Mindset. Glad to have you wherever you are. And I want to introduce you to Maya Sundermeyer, who is our guest this week. Maya has all sorts of interesting things that we get to discuss. She does a lot addressing the concept of autism, and we're going to find out why, as well as other things. And she has asked me some questions about September 11th, 2001. And I'm curious to learn about her interest in that as well. So we'll get there. Anyway, Maya, welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. How are you? Uh, in the words of my hero and uh, network, Dr. Temple Grandin, it's really great to be here. <laughs> well, I have, I have heard her and uh, we're glad to have you here. Tell me a little bit about maybe your early life, your childhood and some of that stuff. Let's start, let's start at the beginning, as Lewis Carroll would say. Oh, yeah. Now you're making me think of the sound of music. Let's start at the very <laughs> beginning. There you go. <laughs> so, so we'll now, start with dough. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so anyway, I don't want to dry, dive off topic too much. But <laughs> anyway, Mr. Hingson. So my early childhood, I was uh, born when I was born. I was, it was my understanding that I was, first of all, stuck in the womb and then they got me out. I had swallowed a great deal of placenta. And so there caused some, that caused anoxia, that caused the brain damage. And so my mom and I looked at each other they, when they looked at the doctor and he spanked the fluid out of me. And so I nearly died uh, at childbirth, but the doctor saved my life. And then what? Well, and then I started to develop according to my late aunt. I mean, she died in 2019. I lived with her for a while and she and I had a mother and a daughter relationship, but that was in my twenties. Uh, that was in most of my twenties. But, uh, when she uh, would come and meet with my, my parents and she'd meet with me, she, uh, she said that other people in the room would try to talk to me and they thought that I was deaf. So, and then as I began to develop into a toddler, my mom noticed that I was staring into space. I wasn't interested in toys. And she also noticed that I would script, meaning I would uh, copy lines from movies and TV shows and commercials. And she specifically remembers the Burger King commercial where I said, where the, the old lady says, where's the beef? Where's the beef? And, <laughs> yeah. And so my mom caught the, caught me uh, say, where's the beef? And I, I do recall, she said that I think she, they were outside grilling outside of a house that we were renting at the time. And I just ran upstairs and I blurted it out. And my mom thought it was funny. I, I went, where's the beef? And so uh, that was a sign right there. And then my mom had started to wonder as to whether or not I uh, was somewhere on the autism spectrum. But keep in mind, this was back in the 80s. And back then, autism was looked at very differently. And this was even before that movie Rain Man, which, by the way, is not my favorite film. <laughs> understand. So he, he did a good job of acting, but I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Well, I just didn't like the idea that uh, they were putting autism into a box Yeah, and you know, they just, uh, it was just, just one person on the spectrum. And I mean, he was, um, I mean, Raymond wasn't a real character, but it's my understanding that he was based on another individual on the spectrum who was uh, known as a savant. And now the thing is, uh, the thing is, there's studies suggesting that there's only 1% of the autistic population that even suggests that you would have uh, the savant type syndrome. So anyway, so go ahead and, uh, and continue. So you, uh, you really weren't like Rain Man, which is understandable. No, uh, no, it's my understanding. According to my parents, I was two years old. I just thought it was a normal kid back when I was two, but you know, I just, uh, I just, I got in trouble a lot with, with some of our babysitters because I was just so hyper and nobody understood that at the same time, my mom took me to a series of doctors and I didn't even think there was anything wrong with me. I thought that it was a normal routine. And I thought that every child went through that. I remember also going to a special preschool 
And the special preschool, they had uh, IQ testing and they had me play with special blocks. But at the same time, when they would observe me one-on-one, I'd want to play with the blocks. But then the, uh, the specialist would always grab my fingers and stop me from putting the blocks together. And I hated that. I just, I, could, I didn't know why. why. Why was that, that they stopped you from putting the blocks together? Well, they were using a special, well, I think they were trying to run tests on me. I think they were doing uh, IQ type tests and things like that. And so I could, so I didn't understand that what they were doing was they were running some tests on me to uh, test my IQ. And they were also trying to figure out why I was hyper at the same time. They couldn't figure out what was wrong with the autistic traits Even though back then my mom tried talking to the doctors about uh, actually our family doctors, you know what? I think my daughter might have autism and they laughed at her because, uh, because autism back in the eighties was looked at like rain man and was also looked at as if everyone on the spectrum was just very, very profound, even though, even though it was coming out that uh, Dr. Temple Grandin, I mean, she, I mean, by the 80s, she was already uh, beginning to share her story in meetings and conferences across America and and eventually the part of the world. So they just uh, nobody was making a connection. So when did they finally decide that that autism was a part of your life? That wasn't until I was 11. I was first diagnosed with ADHD and I was placed on medication before that. And then I was continuing to go to the doctors, but they didn't officially diagnose me as an autistic or a person on the spectrum until I was 11 years old. And back then they preferred it to, to me as a PDD NOS, or which was pervasive developmental delays, uh, hyphen, none other specified. Well, that helps. Yeah. And back then they referred to me as a woman with high functioning autism or a female with high functioning autism, which is rare. So, and then uh, I was placed into special education for the rest of my, uh, uh, the rest of my high school uh, from sixth grade all the way up to a 12th grade. And, you know, that's just, that, that was a big mess. Let me tell you. How so? Well, first of all, um, it started with, I hated studying. I hated sitting still and doing homework. I wanted to goof off all the time. And I think, which is normal for any kid. And yes. so I, every, every night, my mom would struggle to get me to sit down and do my homework. And I would sit and have a fit because I hated the studying. And then on top of all that, I, uh, I would fail at my grades. I mean, I would mm-hmm. fail at my exams because I wasn't, I wasn't studious. But then they put me into special education and uh, I had, we had all the acute tests and they just basically told my mom, don't waste any time with her. She'll never amount to anything. So. I mentioned before we started recording that you could go hear one of my speeches, which talks in great detail about September 11th. And the fact is that part of that speech discusses that when it was discovered that I was blind at about four months, the doctor said that my parents should put me in a home because no blind child could ever grow up and amount to anything. So uh, we're not alone in that, are we? No, we're not. And it's just amazing what these teach these doctors and these special education teachers. I don't know where they get these ideas from. I don't know where they get this idea that just because everyone's disabled, it doesn't mean they're going to fit into a box according to the DSM manuals. Well, the the fact is that no matter what they choose to believe or not, they are still reflections of society. And unfortunately, people with disabilities are still not really included, understood, or really educated about in a lot of the professions. It's slowly getting better, but even back in the 80s, much less back in the 1950s, when I was born and grew up, it still was, and to a large degree today, still is a problem. 
Mm-hmm. So yep. we, we deal with it. So tell me a little bit about the autism spectrum. I don't know a lot about that, and I don't know how many of our listeners do. Can you give us a little bit of an insight as to what it is, where you fit on it, and how that whole process works? So the autism spectrum is very, very broad. It, it, the, you have uh, people on the spectrum like myself who can articulate, we can dress ourselves, we can hold down jobs, we can go to college, we can get married. And I mean, me, I'm in a relationship right now. And, you know, I have my own place. And I've uh, got a bachelor's degree, I'm getting ready to go back at some point and get my doctorate. I'm planning on developmental psychology. But you also have other people on the spectrum that can talk, but they have other challenges. I mean, I don't like to say the functioning label. We don't like to say that. We don't say high functioning, low functioning. Yeah. We have people on the, uh, who, you know, who are a little more moderate and they can talk, but uh, socially and emotionally, their brain doesn't develop as quickly. I mean, I had some challenges of my own and uh, my brain didn't start developing until I was much older. Um, for them, some of them uh, actually uh, develop the social skills of a child or so the social skills of a, um, <laughs> of a child or, or up to the level of a teenager. And yes, they can dress themselves, but they have very poor social skills. And then they have other challenges. Like some of them have underlying conditions. Some of them have uh, cerebral palsy. But it doesn't mean like they're not limited from everything. They just uh, have to work around their uh, their challenges or their disabilities. And uh, some of them have to have uh, coaching and mentoring. And you know they can. I mean they can do it. But some of them need more uh, more coaching and mentoring. I mean I still needed coaching and mentoring like everybody else. And then you have other people on the spectrum with a more the severe end. They can't articulate at all and. Um, they refer to them as nonverbal uh, or some other self-advocates refer to them as uh, people who don't use formal language. I mean, they can talk, but they use a uh, hollow phrases, meaning that uh, they say one word phrases like like they'll like they'll say something like, uh oh, or. Uh oh, or they'll, they'll just quote a line from a TV show. And then there are other people on the spectrum that just cannot articulate at all. They cannot use the one word phrases. And then some of them, they just, they can't dress themselves. They can't bathe themselves. Some of those people end up in group homes and th those situations. I mean, it's not that they're fully broken. It's just that they can't take care of themselves, but for them, they would have to use a communicative device or use some sort of a sign language and they, they have to have the extra help. But actually, uh, but actually, well, they have a brain. Actually, they're very, very intelligent, but they have you have to unlock that brain and you have to teach them how to type because they have thought they have thoughts like everyone else. And then you have people on the spectrum that have severe sensory input, meaning that they can't stand certain sounds and they can't stand certain colors or they can't stand certain smells. Some of them uh, cannot control their bodies. They cannot control their body movements. And then some of them, they just, uh, you know, they just, they cannot, they cannot use the toilet by themselves. So it really ranges. Um, so. Several years ago, I delivered a speech somewhere and I don't recall exactly what it was. I think it was some sort of association of nurses. And there was also someone else who spoke who, was on the autism spectrum. And she said at the beginning in describing herself that she tended to react to loud sounds. And about 10 minutes into the speech, for some reason, the microphone started giving feedback. Uh, something was too loud or whatever. And she reacted to that. It was a, a pretty, for me, graphic illustration and helped me understand part of, of the whole process. But she she said up front that she tended to react to loud sounds and it was just the way it was. Yeah. So, by the way, was this woman uh, was this woman, Dr. Temple Grandin? No, chance? it wasn't Temple Grandin. I have heard her speak also. Um, 
but this wasn't Temple Grandin. This was was somebody else, and I can't remember who it was. Mm. So, well, I know there was a Donna Williams from Australia. She had severe sensory uh, disorders. It's what Temple said. She could not stand. Uh, she could not stand looking at fluorescent light bulbs. Hmm. Actually, there's some people on the spectrum that have a uh, was it visual input that uh, yeah, I, I can't remember how Temple phrased it, but she, it, according to one of her book, I think it was the way I see it. And I read it in thinking in pictures that you walk under some of the fluorescent bulbs. And according to the way the brain processes information, the lights will flicker like a strobe light. So right. there are people on the spectrum that cannot stand that. And there are people on the spectrum that cannot even handle led lights. And, I mean, I'm not one of those people. For me, I don't like micro microphone input either. I just, I hate it. And then uh, it's funny you mentioned Temple and we're talking about sensory input. She was doing an interview and she kept imitating the sound of, uh, of a microphone input and it hurt my ears. Every time she did it, like I thought to myself, Temple, stop doing that. So. <laughs> well, this person... Um, as I said, reacted when the the squealing of the feedback happened. And it took her about a minute or a minute and a half to recover and be able to continue. They dealt with the issue of feedback and the rest of the speech was fine. But it it makes sense that different people react in different ways. And that's, of course, what the whole idea of in a sense, the spectrum is about. It's very difficult to sit there and say people fit in one box and that uh, you are somewhere on the spectrum and somebody else might be at the same place on the spectrum as you, but it doesn't mean that they necessarily react the same way you do. Yeah. Uh, there's also speculation out there. And that's why it's called, that's why you have neurodivergence because uh, there's a saying that no two snowflakes are alike. Right. And there's also another saying out there that goes, uh, just because you meet one autistic uh, means that you meet one autistic. And I mean, uh, Dr. Temple and I have very, very different types of disabilities. For her, she cannot stand the feeling of scratchy clothes. I mean, I, I, I agree with that on her, but you cannot walk in front of her while she is giving a talk. And actually, I blogged for Future Horizons, and I've had a chance to go to some of her talks that are put on by Future Horizons. I kept getting up to use the bathroom. Um, this was just before the pandemic. And, you know, I kept walking, and then Temple called me out in front of everyone. She goes, you really don't need to be texting. Because I was uh, sitting there tweeting about the event, and I thought, are you, talking to, are you talking to me? And she goes, no, you walked out of here twice. And then she also uh, said, don't worry, you'll thank me later. And then she brought up uh, one of her own life memories of a, of a boss that slammed down um, a container of deodorant. And I said, you always do. And she goes, do you need to sit in the back? And then, sorry, she said, do you need to go sit in the back? And I just kept on talking. I just, she just kept on talking. And what were you doing anyway? And then I, I explained to her, well, why didn't you just explain to her what I was doing? I was, I said, I'm not texting, I'm tweeting, I'm promoting your event. And I told her what I do. And she goes, well, why did you say so in the first place? And then me, I said, Temple, Temple, I was waiting for you to get done talking. So, but yeah, I've had her on my podcast a couple of times. And I mean, I've known her since uh, 2014 and I've uh, presented alongside her before. So. We were at the same event, but we didn't get actually to meet. Uh, she spoke over lunch, and I was near the back of the room just coincidentally, so we never did really get a chance to meet. I was hoping to have an opportunity to do that, but she had to leave right away, so we didn't get to do it, unfortunately. Well, she's very, very nice, and I think you two would hit it off. I'd, I'd bet, love to meet I her. Think, I think she would be a great guest on your show. Well, um, would love to explore that. And if you can help us make contact, we'd love to have her on. I mean, she's a person who is yeah. extremely well known and mm -hmm. I would, would love to meet her in person. And I don't, I don't even, I can probably go back and research where it was that I heard her uh, very fascinating speaker, needless to say. Yeah. 
she's so funny too. I mean, she just, it's like, and she's ran, it's like, she's randomly funny too. Yeah. Well, and, uh, and that's okay. People are as they are. So in you describing the whole idea of autism, and I realize they're not related, but how is autism and the way people function and behave different, or how does it compare with, say, people with Down syndrome? Well, for a person with Down syndrome, I don't really know much about it. I don't know much about what Down syndrome does, but the, for Down syndrome, it is genetic, and the, I believe that autism is genetic too, but for Down syndrome, you have the extra chromosome, as far as I know. But uh, I also understand that people who are Downs also have other medical conditions that are underlying. And it's my understanding that uh, people who have Down syndrome don't live very long and mm -hmm. their lifespans are shorter. And I suspect as they get older, they uh, deal with issues such as specific types of Alzheimer's disease. And so I think a lot, most of the people who are Downs, I mean, they've died in their 30s. Um, I, wonder, I, really I wonder about the, the, the intelligence level or the intelligence differences, because I know that clearly people with autism, as you pointed out, can be extremely intelligent. It isn't really a lack of intelligence in any way. I don't know enough about Down syndrome either to understand that. Well, there are, but there, you know, there are um, advocacy movements right now for people who are Downs. In fact, there's a whole movement um, in the college setting called inclusive post-secondary education right. that allows people with Downs, people who are Downs. Uh, that the DSM annual would refer to as an intellectual disability. And, you know, for an autistic, I prefer it as, a, as a develop I, I have a developmental disability, yes. Uh, but for a person with Down syndrome, they are considered to have uh, intellectual disabilities, but they have specific curriculums now with inclusive post-secondary education. And uh, they... You know, they let the individuals take special class, uh, regular college classes and be with their peers. And uh, right and at the moment, they're trying to go from just the individuals auditing, auditing the classes to taking college courses. But they're also trying to get them out into the world and get them into internships where they get to do things that their normal peers do. Uh, and they're also doing other types of programs for people on the spectrum in college settings too. They're trying to come up with a special uh, accommodations because there's a large number of people on the spectrum right now that have been struggling with college because of um, accommodation issues or executive functioning issues. And myself Is included, because I'm getting ready to, um, I'm getting ready to go back to take some post back classes this fall and I'm looking for accommodations because I want to want some internships and I want to get into research and I want to build up some skill sets in that area and learn how to talk with my professors. Well, and you are clearly an intelligent individual who knows what they need to have in the way of accommodations. And clearly, as we understand all being from the community of persons with disabilities, reasonable accommodations are appropriate. Mm -hmm. So is yep. autism considered an intellectual disability in any way? No, not that I know of. I mean, That's usually, I you, usually if you had an intellectual disability, there would probably be a dual diagnosis. You probably mm. have someone on the spectrum, but they would also have a diagnosis if they had a, uh, fetal alcohol syndrome combined with autism or they would have down syndrome, which would be the intellectual disabilities and then autism, which would be the developmental disabilities. So it just really depends on how the child develops in the womb. So you, um, I think have talked a little bit about the concept of raising awareness of autism and being autistic as opposed to acceptance. Tell me about that if you would. Well, actually, I believe in standing right in the middle. 
I believe in accept, in raising autism awareness and acceptance because I think that they're both important. And I do not believe that raising awareness through organizations like Autism Speaks and Aut and you know is it the Autism Society of America? I do not believe that that's the best way to educate people. I just think that uh, that way to raise awareness and acceptance are just way too big. I just think that uh, that awareness should be more at the community level. I mean, it starts in our homeowners associations. It starts in our town halls. It, it starts in our schools. It starts with our parents. And it can start by having little town hall meetings or little meetings through your homeowners association. And it starts with community building and connecting with each other. That's where the awareness starts. And then you have the acceptance part again at the community level where you have uh, families and you have individuals and you have, uh, you have employers that work in the community that, that, <laughs> that could also teach with, teach the individual social skills and soft skills and work skills and get these individuals employed. Because right now what we have is just uh, way too big. And right now there's a lot of misunderstanding about autism. And because of that, we have uh, individuals out there that are 90% either unemployed or underemployed. Mm -hmm. That's true across all disabilities to a very large degree. I know for many years, we who happen to be blind have felt that the unemployment rate among employable blind people is in the 70% roughly range. And it isn't because we can't work. It's because people think we can't work. And I suspect that it's the same for you. Mm, yeah, because a lot of people think that we don't, because we're autistic, they think that we don't understand something. Yeah, and that's not necessarily true at all. Well, I'm curious about something, if I, if I might, and that is that we have heard over the past several years, parents talk about not vaccinating their children because they might become autistic or that autism is caused by vaccinations and so on, and that there's been a great increase and in spike in autism because of vaccinations and so on. Where do you fit into that? So, again, I was already... I already started share, showing symptoms of autism when I was developing as an infant, because again, when I was young, my family thought that I was deaf when it mm -hmm. was really part of the autism, because as probably as a baby, I was hyper, probably very hyper-focused on some color or hyper-focused on something in the room as my eyesight was developing. And so I probably wasn't even paying attention to my late aunt Lois. Uh, so there's that. But as far as the vaccination goes, I do not think that that's autism at all. I think that uh, there's some sort of a disorder that mimics autism, but it's not autism. Like look at Lyme's disease. And I'm not saying that there's Lyme's disease in the vaccinations, but Lyme's disease mimics autism. I think that there could also be some sort of an allergic reaction that uh, causes damage to the brain and somehow mimics autism. But I don't think that's autism or maybe they were already autistic, but perhaps uh, there was a there was something in the uh, vaccinations that caused some sort of allergic reaction and that probably aggravated. I mean, I don't know. I haven't done the research. Yeah. These yeah. are just off the top of my head. So I don't know. Well, the other thing that comes to mind is that maybe the vaccinations don't have anything to do with it at all. It is that now we are doing a much better job of diagnosing autism and that, in fact, that has caused a lot of the increase in the number of people who are diagnosed with having autism. Yeah, that's another really good speculation. I think that one's pretty good, too. It's just that, yeah, I know that uh, Dr. Andrew, was it Andrew Wakefield is the one that claims to have caught the, uh, that had discovered that there was mercury in the vaccinations, but his theory since, uh, since got ruled out. And I believe he was caught with plagiarism. I'm not sure. Well, that's not good. 
Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, his theory was ruled out. The thing is, there are people that are still uh, believing his theories and they're still fighting back. Wow. It's too bad that, uh, that there tends to be a lot of that. And unfortunately, we also try to find things to blame one thing or another on when we plain just don't know enough to really understand. We don't have all the answers yet. That's what science is about. And that's why it's also an evolving process. Yep. And science is a slow process. You know, you know, it's funny, you know, there's, a, if you look at the media and they're, they put all this information out there, like green tea makes you healthier. And, you know, and then you look, and then you look at back at those short articles or green tea makes you sleep better. And then you click on the, on the online articles through your local paper. And then you find out that, uh, that there's a, that there are other research papers that were much different than what the media uh, put it out there to be. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There are a lot of misconceptions that are put out by people all over the place who don't really understand. And unfortunately, a lot of it comes from the media, but we live in a society today where basically everything gets dumped into the world for people to see. And there are always people who believe it. And so the result is that a lot of things get spread that maybe it would be better to wait and see. Exactly. We hear about climate change today, and there are a huge number of people who just don't believe it, or it's the natural scheme of things and there's nothing we can do about it. Um, but a lot of people who just plain don't believe in the idea of climate change. Yeah. There's way too much evidence that says that it really is something that maybe we do have some control over and that greenhouse gas emissions should be addressed and we should deal with some of those things. Yeah. And then there are situations where you have wildfires. Uh, I, you know, that I understand that people can still be uh, conservative and be careful, but I heard that, is it out there in California? There's some areas that get dry. And sometimes you have uh, these brush fires and these forest fires that are caused by heat lightning because the ground is so dry in California. Is that true? Oh, it's absolutely true. There are, there are any number of things that cause the wildfires out here. Um, there are also, in reality, a number of them that are caused by power lines that touch something and ignite a spark. And we're not doing enough fast enough to upgrade the infrastructure. But yeah, there is what heat lightning can do. It is very dry. And so it's not magic to imagine that some of the fires can be created by some of these things. And that's probably been true all along. But now we want to find other ways to, to blame things rather than looking at the issues and how do we address them? Yeah, exactly. And autism, and autism is the same thing. Um, is it caused by something we do? I don't know that I've seen evidence of that. Uh, is blindness caused by something we do? Well, some, some people who have become blind uh, certainly became blind because of medical issues. Premature babies were given oxygen, pure oxygen environments, and their retinas tended to malform. Um, and it took a while for medical science to recognize that too much oxygen might not be a good thing after all. Yeah, so it's a, exactly. again, an evolutionary process. Yeah. Well, you know, we were, you know, I'm a big little house on the prairie fan. Mm. And for years, uh, Laura's sister, uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder's sister, uh, Mary Ingalls. And I'm not just talking about the TV show, ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about uh, the, the real historical figure, Mary Ingalls. Uh, so uh, at first they thought uh, she had uh, gotten, she ended up becoming blind because she had scarlet fever, but then they discovered later on that there was some other disease in their eyes and that it just caused her eyesight to dim. And then she lost it completely. And then she was blind the rest of her life. Yeah. So, and then there was Helen Keller. I think she saw at one point and then she became, what was it? Blind, deaf and mute. Correct. So, yeah. But, but clearly 
had a lot of intelligence and learned to function in the world in which she lived and and hopefully helped a lot of other people grow. All too many people quote Helen Keller, but they don't really go back and intellectually understand that because of who she was and what she did, those quotes are meaningful and ought to be taken to heart. And it doesn't mean that we're less capable. It means that we do things in a different way. Have you ever yes. heard, have you ever heard people use the term differently abled? No, I haven't, but um, that would make sense. But I've used the term human detour system because I was tired of the word disabled. So I decided to call it the human detour system by learning how to focus on your abilities and uh, really building on those strengths and working around the things that you can never do, which, which are your disabilities. Cause that way you don't let the, you don't let your disability steal your life and let that ruin your joy. So. Well, and the reason I asked the question is I personally don't value the concept of quote differently abled end of quotation, because I don't think that we're differently abled. We may do things in a different way, but hey, there are lots of sighted people who do things differently because they're left-handed. Does that make them differently abled? It only means no. that they may use some alternatives to what most people do. And the same if you're blind or have any other kind of disability. And I agree with you. I don't like the term disability, but I think that the community overall has tried to address that by saying you don't call people disabled people you call them persons with disabilities. Now, for my part, I believe society in general, every single person on this planet has a disability, and people have heard me say this on the podcast, but I believe that sighted people have the disability that they're light dependent. And Thomas Edison invented the electric light bulb to allow people to mostly cover up and ignore their disability of being light dependent until the time that there's a power failure and then they have to run for the flashlights and the candles, but it doesn't change the fact that they have a disability. No, it doesn't. Um, I mean, sure. It doesn't change the fact. I mean, just because I live on my own, I take the bus everywhere. It doesn't change the fact that I have a disability. You're right. Um, I have my moments where things get too overwhelming and I just, um, for an autistic, sometimes things get to be too overwhelming. Like yeah. there are people there are people on the spectrum today that are scared to disclose the fact that they're autistic mm -hmm. because uh, there are people that are scared to accept us. And there are people on the spectrum that uh, like to do something called masking, which is a form of uh, trying to blend in. So people don't bully us. So people don't judge us. Like there are people on the spectrum that will, uh, they won't fit. They won't stem meaning they won't rock back and forth. They won't fidget when they're out in society. And so each day they will go out and try to uh, pretend to be normal and just basically blend in like a chameleon. And then by the time they get home, they are mentally and physically exhausted. And over time, that burnout builds up. Yes. So um, and I think there I think there are a lot of people with various disabilities who probably somewhat work the same way. Um, or they just plain resent the disability. And it oftentimes takes a long time, if at all, that people recognize there's nothing wrong with being different. There's nothing wrong with having this so-called disability. And I agree with you. I wish there were a better term. But it is the term that we have. And society is great at changing definitions. I mean, look at diversity. Um, we should be included in diversity, but we're not that is anyone with a disability, the conversation tends not to include us. They talk about race and gender and sexual orientation. Disabilities generally aren't included. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like people don't understand that. You know, they they think that we're whining and we're not. We're saying, hey, we're, you know, disabilities are, uh, are part of diversity, too. Yeah. And so it's important that people start to recognize that it's okay. Now, um, I and I mentioned speeches that I've given that we have on the podcast. If you listen to the second show uh, on our podcast, you will hear me deliver a speech that I love to call moving from diversity to inclusion, because I won't accept 
that you can be partially inclusive. Either you are inclusive or you're not. And if you're inclusive, then you need to, and you must include disabilities. Otherwise you're not inclusive. Yeah, exactly. So when did you start your podcast? Started it last September, actually. So we have done 38 shows so far. We were given a, and we actually made editor's choice for podcast magazine in February of 2022. Total surprise, but excited by that. That's awesome. So yeah, it's, it's kind of exciting. Cool. You mentioned September 11th. What is your interest in? Why did you bring up the concept of September 11th? Well, I just, when I, I read that you're a survivor oh. and <laughs> you are the first person I have talked to that has uh, actually been in those buildings. I mean, actually, I take that back. Um, I had friend, I uh, had friends up in the DC area, and they didn't see the Pentagon uh, get uh, blown up. But they said that they were on their way to work, and everything shut down. And because the the metro in DC was shut down, they spent three hours walking home. Well. I wanted to talk to you about your experiences because you're the first person I have met that that was actually in those attacks. And uh, 9-11 was, you know, is a part of my life, just like it's a part of everyone's life. And so how did you how did you react to September 11th? What what was it like for you? So 9-11 for me was very interesting. And um I remember I was, I was staying uh, at a hospital with a friend and she was a teenager. It was a teenage pregnancy and she was a girl I grew up with. And so I was in the hospital supporting her and her mom with a new baby. And uh, the baby's, the baby's father was there. And um, I remember getting up the next morning and I was planning on uh, uh, moving to the same area that my friend and her boyfriend and her mom were, and they're going to help. They were going to start helping me the next day as well as uh, get settled in with that new baby. But anyway, I went downstairs, I had breakfast and I was waiting for the, the gift shop to open when a few nurses came in and they started talking about somebody trying to take over America. And I mm. said, what's going on? And one of the nurses kind of brushed me off. She went, Ugh. then she walked away. And I said, did I just hear you say that someone's trying to take over America? And I heard, well, the Pentagon, the Pentagon just got bombed. And at first I blew it off and I uh, walked out of the cafeteria and I went over to the gift shop, which was not open. And I looked and there was a waiting area by the, um, the emergency room. And I walked over, I walked over there and I saw smoke on TV and I said, what's going on? And someone said bomb. And then I heard there was a plane that uh, slammed into the World Trade Center. Mm -hmm. And so I sat there trying to take in the scene and I was watching as uh, both of uh, the twin towers were on fire. It was just a very unrealistic situation. And of course I was so zoned out by it that I completely, uh, I completely missed the, the, the South tower collapse. Mm. And I thought, uh, I thought, what's going on? I just thought there was a lot of smoke. And then someone said that uh, the South Tower has collapsed. That's why you're seeing all the smoke. And then all of a sudden I saw one tower standing that was the North Tower. And I, I first thought, well, at least there's one tower left. And then I was able to go to uh, the gift shop and buy, my, and buy that present for my friend and go back upstairs. But they, they were just turning on the radio and I just hopped back in the elevator and I thought, yeah, I think the set. Yeah, I think the North Tower is going to fall. So I went upstairs, told my friend, turned on the TV, and as I was tur as I was turning on the TV, there, you know, there was this, there was the North Tower falling, and I mean, I remember just, <laughs> I remember being very, um, <laughs> I remember feeling very sick after that. I mean, I almost threw up when I saw the second one fall. So much less, much less the Pentagon. But of course, uh, I, well, I don't know, actually, did they did they show much on the news about the Pentagon? Because when I heard about it, I spoke I had been speaking with my wife after both towers fell. So 
Of course, the Pentagon was a different thing, but I don't know how much they actually showed of the Pentagon on the news. Oh, they went back and forth. But I just remember seeing more of uh, the footage of the World Trade Centers. And I remember everybody in the hospital. I mean, they were trying to get uh, my friend out of the hospital that everybody, everybody was focused on the attacks, Mm -hmm. even when everybody was at the hospital working. Yeah, Uh, everyone of course, got focused on this because it's something that we had never experienced before. Yeah. And it, it became a, a, needless to say, a very intense thing. And I agree with most people. You'll always remember where you were on September 11th. I was in the eighth grade when President Kennedy was shot. It's the same sort of thing because I remember that I was and my whole class was taking a test in our constitution and government class in the eighth grade. And Mr. Brown was reading me the questions quietly while everyone else was taking the written tests. And of course, my job was to answer them. And my seventh grade teacher, Mr. Renzullo, came in and just quietly spoke to Mr. Brown and I heard it. Uh, that President Kennedy was just shot, turned the TV on. And of course, it wasn't long then before he died, the flags went to half staff, and everyone was sent home. So when there are major events like that, yeah, we do remember where we are. And then the issue is, how do we deal with them? And that's what ultimately is, is what we have to discuss regularly and think about is, how do we deal with events like this when they occur? Yeah. So uh, me, when I saw the World Trade Center's fall, it was very hard for me, you know, when they they fell, because it was hard for me to even imagine that there were people in there when they fell. And so I thought, I thought, too, that maybe everybody had gotten out, but they didn't. Yeah, they didn't. Uh, The people and by the way, mostly that was the people who were above the impact points of the airplanes. I think about 90%, as I heard about it from a police officer, 90% of the people we lost were above where the planes hit. So there were very few people, relatively speaking, who were below, who didn't make it out. But it doesn't matter. There were still people who didn't. And we should remember and honor those people always. Yeah. Um, I remember seeing video footage on the news of there were family members that were in denial this and they they were showing pictures of their loved ones. This is my husband. He's missing, and you know, just seeing just seeing the reaction of them, you know, uh, you know, of that whole grief process. Can you find my loved ones, please? Can you find my loved ones? So, one of my stories of September 11th is that two weeks later, was it two weeks? I think it was. I was in the city meeting with someone and my wife called and said that she had just gotten a call from someone who was looking for me. And uh, the way the phone call went was that when my wife answered, the, the guy asked if this was the Hinkson residence. And of course she said, yes. And he said, well, I'm, I'm trying to find Michael Hinkson. Um, is this where he lives? And she said, yes. And he was very uncomfortable. And he said, well, um, is, is he okay? And she said, well, yes. Um, why are you asking? It turns out that he worked for 9X, which is, of course, now part of Verizon. And he had been on the pile, which it was back then, that is the, the, the remains of the towers, they were looking for bodies and looking for people and so on. And he found a plaque with my name on it. Mm. He took it home. He polished it up. And then he started trying to find me on any of the lists. It wasn't on any of the the list of people who'd passed, at least as far as they knew, as far as he knew. Anyway, somehow he eventually tracked us down. And so while I was in the city, I did meet him and 
he gave me the plaque and so on. And we got a chance to meet and visit, but I can almost, well, I can understand people saying, well, would you help me find my loved one? Because at the, at least at the beginning and for some time, it wasn't necessarily very clear who totally survived and didn't survive. Really? Did they ever find anybody alive under the rubble? Not after the first day or two, but there were a couple of people who were, for example, in the stairwell of one of the towers who, if you will, rode the stairwell down. There was, I think, a police officer. And there was a woman that I believe a day or two days later, they were digging through and eventually I think she yelled and they were able to pull her out. So there were a couple. So it's one of those kind of events where you just never know. And that's why people do a lot of searching after events like this, because you don't know who might be surviving and who might not be surviving. Yeah. So you were mentioning that uh, 9-11 wasn't as uh, just walking down the stairs trying to get out wasn't as scary for you? Well, for me, and again, this is something we've talked about, but I'll, I'll answer your question. I spent a lot of time once I was working in the World Trade Center exploring it. I was the Mid-Atlantic Region sales manager for a computer company, so it was my job to run an office, to run our facility in New York. And my position was to do that, I needed to make sure that I knew everything I could about where things were around the World Trade Center, how to get from place to place, what were the emergency evacuation procedures, what were the fire safety procedures, and so on. And I spent a lot of time over weeks learning that, which really created a mindset for me that told me that I knew what to do in an emergency. And so as a result, when it happened, that mindset kicked in. We're actually now working on a book to talk about that because what I realized as a public speaker who's been traveling and speaking about September 11th now for 20 plus years, what I've not done is begun to teach people how they can learn to not let fear, as I call it, blind them, but rather use fear as a powerful tool to help and control their fears. So it's something that we're working toward. And I think that 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 same fear is the same sort of thing that all of us as persons with disabilities face from so many people who are just afraid, oh, I don't want to end up like them. In one sense, I think at some level, they realize disabilities is an equal opportunity uh, contributor to people's lives, and they could become a person with a disability in some way. I know. And and the problem is that, so, um, if you do, do you have the strength or will you find that you have the strength to learn to do things in a different way? And that's what people are so uncomfortable about. Yeah. Now, had I... You know, had I been in the towers that day, I probably would, if I wasn't, uh, wasn't super high up, like at the top, like looking out, I think I, if I would have seen the, uh, seen the South tower on fire, I would, you know, I would have seen the explosion. I would have been gone. I would have ran down those stairs and I would have gotten out of there. Sure. Um, running wouldn't necessarily have worked because the stairs were pretty crowded. And in fact, when people started to panic on the stairs, we worked to to try to keep them quiet or at least to calm them down to recognize that we all were in this together. We're all going to work to get out together. And a number of us had those kinds of things that we had to work on during the trip down. For me, when the plane hit, we were 18 floors below where the plane hit in tower one. So I was on the 78th floor, but no one near me physically in the building at all. No one on our side of the building knew what happened because The plane hit on the other side of the building, 18 floors above us. Mm -hmm. So if I had known an aircraft hit the building, I think I can say it wouldn't have made a difference because I still knew that we had to use the skills and knowledge that we had to get out. But I love information. There were a couple of times that people could have told us 
one was when firefighters were coming up. And then when we got down to the bottom, uh, we met someone from the FBI. And in both cases, they didn't want to talk about what happened. And I can understand that. They don't know me. They don't know what would throw somebody into panic. But again, my situation would be different than yours. And you, you might even just because of uh, autism be more prone to panic or not. I don't know. But, you know, that's, well, that's something no, that, uh, no, for me, it would have been a fight or flight. Uh, yeah. So, but so how long did it take you to get down the stairs? Was I, I read, how long did it take you to get down the stairs uh, with your coworker? Well, from the time the plane hit until we got outside, it was an hour. So it took you an hour to get down. Wow. Yep. Yeah, I'd, I'd also read that uh, the, uh, of the sprinkler systems were going off down the stairwells as well. There probably later on, there were um, the sprinkler systems were on at the bottom when we got, got there. But mm -hmm. when we were going down the stairs, the sprinklers weren't on where we were. Um, and I don't know. I assume that there were sprinklers in the stairs, but this, I don't know whether there were, but the sprinkler systems at the bottom of the stairwell were on. They formed a barrier between the exit to the stairwell and the lobby of the World Trade Center towers. And you can imagine why that was. They wanted to make sure that if fire broke out in the lobby, it wouldn't get into the stairwell. Or if it did get into the stairwell and the air currents took it down, that the fire wouldn't get out into the lobby. So there was a, a, a goodly amount of water that was falling from the sprinklers. Yeah. And then, you know, it sounds like you got out in the nick of time, too. Well, I got out from Tower 1 at 945. So we had a little bit of time to get away. But at the same time, we ended up very close to Tower 2 when it collapsed. So we were about 100 yards away. So we ended up having to face it. And you had to face all the, from what I read, you had to face all the dust. What did you do to cover your faces? Nothing for a little while, but then somebody was passing out some masks later on and we got some. Yeah. And how long did it take before you got out of that area, out of Grand Zero? Um, probably by the time we really got up to Canal Street or um, in that area, which was a little bit away from Ground Zero, it was about 1115 or 1130, I think, by the time we got there. And then, <laughs> yeah. then later we got further up north. Yeah. Because, well, you know, the thing is that we all react differently to different situations, but we tend to have a lot more power to be able to deal with things if we truly try to know. And my point is I wasn't going to rely on people who had signs or read signs. I needed to know what to do. And I will always take input, but I needed to know what to do. And that created a much more firm conviction in my mind that there wasn't a need to be afraid. And I did use a lot of input from both guide dog Roselle at the time and from the comments of other people that gave me more information going down the stairs. And I think that's something that no matter who we are, those are the kinds of things that we need to do. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you got out of there safely. I mean, what, it, like I said, I'm really glad that, you didn't end up uh, caught up in the, the towers as they fell. Yeah. yeah, me, me too. Well, and I'm glad that you are, are doing well and you're going off to get your PhD, huh? Yeah. Well, right now I'm going, I mean, I was planning on uh, going to school back uh, during nine 11. I just didn't know how I was going to do undergrad back at 19. I had just advocated to get out of special ed and I was not going to do another transition program because I didn't like, how the special education teachers were uh, telling me that I needed to do this direction all because of the DSM and telling me that everything, every dream I wanted was um, unrealistic. And so they kept shooting it down. And so uh, they tried to put me under a conservatorship or they tried to get my parents to, and my parents didn't agree with that. So they told me I could pretty much call the shots. And so at the end of that, uh, that school year, uh, 2001, I just said, Hey, I'm getting out of here and I'm going to find a way to go to college. Mm -hmm. So, but 
I, I mean, I attempted to go back a few times and take some learning support classes after doing what they call as the compass exam, which is, it's an entrance exam for you that you can take at a two-year school versus the, uh, the ACT or the SCT, which uh, they steered me away from. And so I went, I went that route instead. I, um, I, I did the two-year education first with over a five years uh, from 23 to 28. And then I transferred my credits over to Georgia state and I went off and on, uh, before off and on. And then I re- I finally got my bachelor's in 2020. And luckily I was able to graduate outside on my football field due to COVID, which was a big dream of mine. Yeah. So, but good, good for you. But now I'm getting ready to take some post back classes and I want to, I need to be talking to advisors, anybody I can, because I'm fascinated and I have a background that just most of my classes seem to seem to gear towards uh, developmental type psychology and uh, psychology is my baby. So that's what I want to get my doctorate in is uh, developmental psychology. And then I want to go into research and I'd also like to teach. So I, and I don't say this lately, but I'll bet you'll be good at it. You're clearly very articulate. You know what you want to do and that's as good as it Mm -hmm. gets. Yep. Yep. But uh, but along the way, I mean, because I didn't have along the way of my undergrad, um, I didn't have a mathematical background. I didn't really have much of an academic background because I was in special ed and I hated studying. So when I moved to Atlanta from Minnesota at the age of 20, at the age of uh, 21, uh, my aunt told me that, uh, OK, do you want to flip burgers the rest of your life or do you want to go back to school? So about so nearly 20 years ago. I moved down here and uh, started learning how to do math. So there you go. Math is one of my favorite subjects. Nobody understands why. Well, I spent a lot of time getting exposed to it. That's why. And it doesn't matter. It is. And that's, that's the big issue, but yeah, you do have an explanation for it. So that's pretty cool. Well, Maya, we have been talking for now a little bit over an hour. So I am going to, suggest that what we ought to do is to keep in touch. And when you have more adventures about your education to talk about, we should get you to come back on the podcast again. Yep. I will come back and talk about my education, especially Absolutely. as I talk about my progress for that. And then um, I really need to have Temple back on the show. However, I really like to see her in person again. I miss seeing Temple. So. <laughs> Well, if you talk with her, see if she would love to chat and explore coming on Unstoppable Mindset. All right. Well, thank you much. Well, I appreciate it. And uh, if people want to reach out to you, is there a way that they can contact you? Do you have a yep. website or anything or whatever? Yeah. Well, so I'm a podcast host myself. That's and, you said that. Yeah. And I'm currently on a podcast tour and you are number four on the tour. So I have Hello World with Maya. And that's hello world with Maya.podbean.com. That's hello world with Maya.podbean.com. Hello and world I'm, with Maya.podbean.com. Okay. Yeah. And I have two applications. Uh, I am calling for proposals. I'm always looking for guests to be on the show. And I am also on a podcast tour right now. So if, if you know anyone that has any slots that are open, I would love to be on your show. So. Great. Well, we can introduce you to people and make some of that happen. All right. Well, thank you so much. Well, thank you. And I appreciate everyone who is listening to this today. Um, Maya is certainly one of those people that I want to grow up to be like. I can just say that. <laughs> but well, but I'm whoever. About 40 years old. I have a young face, but I'm about 40 now. There you go. Well, I want to thank you again. And thank you all for listening. If you'd like to reach out to me, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the episode. You can email me at Michael H-I, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I at accessibe, A-C-C-E-S-S-I-B-E dot com. You can also go to our podcast page, which is www.michaelhinkson.com slash podcast. Michael Hinkson is M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I-N-G-S-O-N. And if you go to michaelhingson.com slash podcast, or if you're listening to this at some other location, please give us a five-star rating. We appreciate the ratings, and I hope that you'll give us a five-star one for this episode. So again, thank you all for listening wherever you are. And Maya, thank you for listening, or <laughs> you all you listen to, thank you for being here. 
All right. Thank you much. Thank you.